Yeah. Deborah, I'm going to turn it over to you and start off with our first question provided prior to the session. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So our first question that comes in in today, um, I'm going to start off with: Can you review how to pull reports from PC Law for us? Sure. So there are many different ways to pull reports and there are many different reports in PC Law. Obviously we have a reports button and our reports are grouped into uh, sections. Um, the different sections will show you different information about PC Law and the different reports have different features available to them. So in the journal section you're going to get a list of transactions as they relate to the subject matter presented. And I'll start with General Bank and I'll just mention a few things on the report screen. Um, the first thing to note is on most reports you're going to get fields on your common tab that allow you to select information, start date, end date, which bank account, is there a specific check number, is there a specific GL number, how do you want the report set, sorted. Obviously you can choose receipts or disbursements in this case and in almost every single report you're going to get an output box. Now this output box is very important because if you choose something like editor, I'm not going to show it to my screen, you will be prompted at, as the report is generating as to where you want to save that report. So the functionality of editor is to save it on disk in whatever format you choose. Now almost all of the reports with the exception of the productivity reports have the ability to save, be saved in an Excel format, a text format, RTF format is a format that you can usually, it's a rich text format, you can edit it in Word, you can look at it that way, and then of course a PDF format. If you're having problems saving reports as PDF formats, it most likely means that the PDF creator that's provided with PC Law is corrupted, but you should be able to do that. If you go to print a report, so, and again, you're going to pick on your on your computer where you want to save that report. If you are in the process, if you are in the in the habit or if you like to save lots of reports to disks, remember that each time PC Law creates that report, it's just going to give it the name of the report. So if you want to save it with an alternate name, you need to edit that name as you save it. Now I'm going to cancel this and go back into the report to show you just a couple of other things. If you try to email the report and you get an error message that says the PDF could not be created, that means that the PDF file is it is corrupted somehow and you need to reinstall PC Law. Remove it and then reinstall PC Law. Um, but the thing I really want to bring to your attention down here is this layout box. Um, you can change virtually most of the reports that have the layout feature any way you want. And really this is a report writer for you to use. And so even though this is a bank journal, I could use this for other features by taking fields away from the report and adding fields into the report. So to edit this layout, you just either remove a field or you highlight a field and you add a field. So one of the reports that I create almost on every install that I do is a general bank journal and a trust bank journal by deposit slip number because I believe in using the deposit slips and people sometimes don't realize what receipt is attached to what deposit slip. And so you can easily just add that deposit slip number to the report and then you can see, hi, hey, what receipt was this attached to? When you modify the layout of the report, you then need to save it under another name. You cannot save it as default. The system won't allow you. So what typically I would do is just put deposit slip here or something else. But notice that you can change the font. You can change the, the, uh, the, 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 the pitch. Anything that you want to do. The title. The titles of the fields. And so this is really a very powerful tool that most people don't realize is included within the package. I use this frequently to create different layouts within different reports to give clients information that they're looking for. Almost every report in PC Law is going to have a tab that's called Matters. And what this does is it allows you to select which matters are going to be included in that report. Obviously all is the default and everything is selected, but I could do it by client intro, matter intro, responsible, assign lawyers, type of law. Um, there are other reports that sometimes have referral source. Um, I can ask for categories, active, inactive, archive. If I want selected matters, I simply click selected and then I can pick and choose what I want by just checking it. So again, another way to get what you want out of the report by just modifying your selection criteria. 
You'll notice that on the other tab, typically what you get are summaries, uh, whether you want totals, uh, whether you want to include corrected entries. On some of the reports, which I'll show you in just a minute, you can also pick and choose fields because you don't get that layout section. Um, one of the most powerful features in the general journal and the trust bank journal is the ability to select who you paid or who you received money for. So if I, and, I, and I'm not sure what I have in here because this is demo data, um, but let's just put the word client. Maybe I have something that says client. If I click OK, it's going to go through and it's going to show me, and of course I did that bad, wrong because I had selected that method. So again, let's go back into the journal. Let's go to general bank journal. Load last. It is a wonderful button down here. People don't use it and it's great. It's going to take every criteria that I entered the last time I ran the report and leave it in here. So again, I had said show me anything that says the word client in the beginning and maybe I have one receipt from client and notice I'm capital L all the time. I have heavy fingers, but it just shows me that one entry that had to do with the client. Now once that report is shown here, again, you still have those save but same buttons to save it to disk, save it to Excel, email the report, print the report. These binoc binoculars will help you find anything in the report. Um, and then again, this will just make it a little bigger on your screen. These green arrows refresh the report. So if you came in and you changed this transaction, you could come back in and refresh the report to see that change. This particular report those green arrows with the little purple thing in the center, that means reload the report, which means that I want to rerun the report, but now I want to change a parameter. So maybe I'm going to take the name client out of here. So that's what that means. Now one thing I did forget to tell you that I don't want to forget is there is also a button here that's called advanced search. Another way to limit what's going to be reported. So if you click on advanced search, each report's going to give you different options, but there are fields that you could choose here. So oftentimes I'm asked to give a report of all checks that did not clear. Like clearly you can go and you can print your bank rec report, but sometimes that's not what they're looking for. So over here where you have cleared on bank rec and is equal to, and the value is either zero or one, no one knows that, but that is the truth. If the value is zero, it means that my checks are not cleared. And if I want to save this search, I can give it a name. You can see here, I could save this. So I could run this advanced search over and over again. But the power of this is, is really incredible because you do have the ability to scull your reports to use these search criteria over and over again so that you can get the information you need out of PC Law. So one of the things you know I never hear, which is good, is that I can't get information out of PC Law. You can. And the great thing about getting information out of PC Law is you can get it in lots of formats and if it's something else you need, you can always manipulate it in Excel. So that's basically you know how you run these journals, how you would run your um, client related reports, they all typically have the same thing. Where we start to see differences in this are in a lot of the productivity reports. So if I were to go to client whip and billing, you'll see I don't have a matters tab, I don't have a default tab, but I do have a layout. So here I can change the layout and if I make any changes to this layout, I can save it under another name and save those selections that I've done. Um, you see how that came up right away. I could create a new template and this could just be called demo. So again, the ability to save and call out information to extract information in the way you want is very prevalent in PC Law. Um, the other thing I want to bring up when I talk about reports is a report group. Uh, many people don't use this, but you should. So here's an end of month report group. And what this would allow you to do is add any reports to this that you typically do at the end of the month. You could just click this report group, you'll be prompted for a start and an end date, and then all the reports will actually come up. And that's kind of a nice feature to use. Uh, there is also a custom report writer. Um, it's down here under productivity. It says custom reports, and I've done lots of custom reports for clients, but what you should know is that when you do a custom report, typically the fields that are available to you are the aggregate fields, not the individual matter fields. So um, you can use it. They sometimes do take a little bit of time, but it is a feature that's available in PC Law. I hope I've answered your report on how to pull a report, your question on how to pull a report. Awesome. Thank you so much, Debbie. We have a few follow-up questions, too, with uh, reports, so we'll just try to keep this 
organize them that way, right? One of the follow-up questions is, what's the process for closing a client so that it doesn't show up on an active client report? Perfect. So if you close a client, remember you cannot close a client if it has a trust balance, a receivable balance, unbilled disbursements, or transactions that are open, that transactions in the open month. What does that mean? When you go to GL, GL statements, this is the period that you're open to. This is the month, the last month that was closed is the month prior to this. So if you have a matter, and obviously this is my demo data, so my dates are, are crazy, but if I have a matter that has any activity after March 1st, 2005, I will not be able to archive that matter. So that's the key, is you go to matter, you go to close matter, and you want to archive your matters. So archiving the matter is what actually marks it as inact. There's two ways, archive and deactivate. So that makes it inactive or archived. When you print your reports, you'll notice that when I come into that matters tab, you have a choice to say, do I want to include active matters, inactive matters, or archive matters? So if you've closed your matter by deactivating it or archiving it, when you go to print those reports, be sure that those inactive and act archive matters are unchecked. And that's very pertinent when you're trying to print a list of clients, when you're trying to print anything that has client information. Again, you'll see you get that information. You, you can uncheck those and then they won't be included. One other thing on closing a matter. When you click archive, if you don't put a matter number in, it's not going to go archive every matter. Like if you run a bill and you forget to put a matter number in, it'll run in every bill. But what it will do is it'll give you a list of the matters that are eligible to be archived. In my sample data, I don't have any matters that are eligible to eligible to be archived. My mouse just stopped working. That's great. Okay, so if I click on my inactive matters, perhaps maybe I have something there, but I don't. So um, again, that's something that you, you can do here, and obviously I can't really show it that well on my demo data, but you can see how it, how it could work in your environment. So you could archive or you could close out lots of matters at once. Next. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, the next one is regarding when you were pulling, um, when you were generating the report, there was, I guess, a major client in the report screen. Could you speak to what that, what that major client piece yes. is? Absolutely. So in PC Law, every client gets a number. And when you set up that client, you could set up a major client. A very good example of having a major client would be to have something like AT&T. Let, let's say that. AT&T has hundreds of divisions. So AT&T may, may be my major client, and then I might have and I, I don't even know if these companies are still around, this is old information, but there used to be AT&T long lines and there used to be AT&T in different areas. You could have those other subsidiaries set up as clients, but AT&T be the major client. And when you pull up the client, you get to specify in the client manager whether it's a major client or not, or whether you want to associate the matter with a major client. I happen not to have any clients set up as major clients in here. But that is basically the premise of a major client, is that it's a client that would have subsidiaries that maybe have different addresses, maybe have, you know, billing address wouldn't be an issue, but maybe have a different address or something a little bit different. Subsidiaries, sort of. All right, great. Our next question is also about report. Um, they need to run a billing realization report for each individual timekeeper by month and by year. Could you show us exactly how to do that? Well, I did look at that last night, and um, it, it, the billing realization report is really meant to be by client, not by timekeeper. So I think what you may want to do is look at a different kind of report. Um, I did have a client recently tell me that they wanted a report of every timekeeper showing every rate that the timekeeper charged. I can't do that in PC Law with the way it exists. Um, I do have some custom programmers who do some customization in PC Law, and that's one of the things that they'll do for me. But perhaps maybe what might be better for you is if you're trying to find out about particular 
attorneys and how they're using their time and maybe it's not a billing realization but a productivity and this report I think is very good this is a time summary and again remember my sample data I ran it for all dates just so I could give you a pop you know data for you to look at but on this particular report it shows me by timekeeper how much billable work they did and the reason why there's multiple uh, codes in here is because there are multiple task codes that are billable and this particular my demo often I show um, the ABA electronic billing requirements and each of those tasks are billable tasks and so under billable work I see every type of work they did but it does show me the value of the hours the percentage what their hours were the percent of their hours and what rate that they were at and this is an average rate for these entries. Um, you'll also notice that it does also show me the non-billable work and so I'm a big proponent of using time reduction to um, maintain everybody's actual billable hours and so this shows me you know whose time if I had to reduce before billing who had non-billable work and I encourage everybody to use non-billable task codes as opposed to administrative matters so you would see how much you had in CLE credits how much you had in bar association lunches whatever it might be whatever your firm is using but I think that this is when you talk about billing realization by timekeeper this is the kind of report I think that you're actually looking for. Wonderful. Our next question is how do you remove the forced explanation on client receipts? Okay, so PC Law does not have a forced explanation on client receipts. The only thing that I can think is happening is that you're using an explanation code and something's popping in here. Um, I did check that by running the journal report because, again, you know, I do demos all the time and I ask for all my receipts. And you'll notice that when you look at my receipts, that there aren't, the only thing that's forced here is the retainer allocation. And I don't believe there's any way you can take away the retainer allocation, but a regular receipt if you just don't even put an explanation in isn't going to have one. Um, payment is something that I entered. You can see it says payment here. So I wasn't sure what you were trying to get out there because there, as far as I know, there is under here options, lists, task codes, and if you click on defaults, you know, typically they have defaults here, but you'll notice that there is nothing that's going to force anything for a receipt. So I think that could be something unique to your setup. And if you have questions on it, please feel free to give me a call, shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to go over it with you. All right, wonderful. Our next question is, from Matter Manager, can you email multiple documents saved in Matter Manager at the same time? I wish that you could, but my answer is, unfortunately, a no. From Matter Manager, you can only email one document at a time. However, I propose this to you. All that the Document Manager does is it creates subdirectories on your computer, which I'm going to try to show you right now. And I have a messy computer, so please excuse me, but I'm going to go into my Drive C. And I keep my sample data in a subdirectory called Sample Data. On your computers, you would just go right to where your PC Law data folder is. And under Sample Data, you will have um, a DIN data, and a STAT data, and a folder called PC Law Docs. If you open up PC Law Docs, you'll see Active and Archive. And I know that this is really a lot, but you could put a shortcut on your desktop to get to this area. And that, excuse me, of course, you have every single client here. And then underneath the client, you have all of the matters. And then underneath the matters, you will have subdirectories by document type, if that's how you've turned on your document manager. And there is no reason that, you know, you, there's nothing to prohibit you from coming into this area and choosing the documents that way. And as I said, if it were me and this is something you were going to do a lot, I would certainly put a shortcut on my desktop or someplace where you could access this and perhaps initiate your email through Outlook and come in here and pick your multiple documents. But at this point, there is no way within PC Law to do that. Certainly something you need to send to wishlist um, at PCLaw.com. All right, great. Our next question is, um, disbursements only bills do not pull, do not bulk pull time entry nodes. 
do not print. Well, I guess, can you show us how to um, pull disbursement only bills in bulk? I think that's the first question. If I'm reading that wrong, um, if you guys could just let me know. Okay, so there is no way, the way PC law exists right now, there is no way to pull just bill only disbursements. However, what I would suggest to you is that you create a cycle because people tend not to use these cycles and they're a really very powerful tool within the billing module. Cycle allows you to select whatever you want uh, to be billed in bulk. So when you have include, every matter that says include, you just, it gets billed. But the cycles, I have clients that use them for e-billing. I have cycles that, I have clients that use cycles to stagger their cash flow where they build different parts of the alphabet at different times. But this is a perfect example of using a cycle. So if you made all cycle one matters bill only disbursements, when you go to run your pre-bills or your bills, on the options tab, you can actually select your frequency. I got to get this matter number out of here. You can actually select your frequency and just select cycle one. You can select frequency on pre-bills, on bills, and on the work in progress report. So there are three places that you really do get to use it, and it is very, very powerful, and it, it does allow you to create groups of clients that you want to build together. So that is my suggestion to you to get by that. All right, great. Our next question is, is there a way to print time entry notes? So it's, okay, so that's not so easy, but let's talk about it a couple of ways. If I go into reports, I go into productivity, and I go into the time listing. Again, I can change my time listing. Uh, don't get the note here, or do I? I don't think I get the note here. Um, no, I don't get the note here. Um, you can print it on your bill template, I'm pretty sure. Um, I'm not a big one for the notes. I know that a lot of people who come over from Abacus and they're used to using notes in Abacus, because in Abacus you create a, note, a time entry from a note, so a lot of people like it. Um, I'm not a big proponent or lover of the notes, but that doesn't mean anything. That's just me. Uh, let's go to my detailed template. And I'm pretty sure that you can perhaps get the notes on here. Um, and it has to be in the fee section. Yeah, here's your notes. It's, I, I believe it's only the, this is the only place that you can access it, is on the template. Um, as I just saw, you can't, and you know, maybe it's something you want to put on a pre-build template, but it doesn't matter. You can make a template for whatever you want. And you could actually just have a template that just shows time entries and notes and it could be called a note report, and you could run it for every client, and you would see everything, every note. Um, but that is the only way that I know to get those notes. Um, again, wish list at um, pclaw.com. Sorry about that. Well, thank you for showing us a way to do it. That sounds great. Um, our next question is, how do I get comparative financials for this year and last year on a monthly, quarterly, or annual basis? So the financial statements are all about the templates. So what I, what you could do, and I'm going to show you a couple of financial statements, and I'm going to make it the last this month, because again, remember sample data, I don't have a lot of data in here, but so this particular template, INC budget, and every template I'm going to show you is included in PC Law. I'm not showing you any templates I've created. This is going to give you a comparison of a budget. So the BUDG allows you to see actual and budget for current period and year to date. The other template I want to show you is if you take a look at this template, and it's just called income. This one is going to compare this year to last year and on current period and year to date. No, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. This just shows you the current period and, and this one. Hold on, we're going to get it right, Debbie. The next one I wanted to show you was a 12-month comparison. So what this one shows you is it shows you for the past 12 months what you've done. So here's your year to date and then November back to December 15th. So 12 months at a time you get to see. Not really a comparison, but it does show you all of those. The one that shows you the period um, is this one. 
C-O-M-P, I-N-C, no. And this shows you current month, this year, current month last year, year to date this year, year to date last year. Again, my numbers are all screwed up because of my demo data. It, it, it will work, I promise you. Now, if you wanted to do this by quarter, there is nothing that would prohibit you when you produce the report to put a quarter, you know, like a 9-1, or a, I'm sorry, that's wrong, a 10-1 to a 12 and do it that way. Because again, the periods that you define here are the periods that are being reported. The default is a month, but there's nothing to prohibit you from putting a quarter in, and again, a year. Um, but that, that is, though, it, it's all about the templates. Now, if you're not sure what the templates are going to show you, you know, my suggestion is try them. And that's, that's the way you're going to learn them. But the ones that I typically use the most are the comparative income statement, the budget, the 12-month comparison, and just income. But again, you have the ability through your template editor to modify any of these templates. So if you go to File, you go to Open, you choose just your income statement templates, again, you can go into anything you want and, and modify it. Okay? Wonderful. All right, our next question is, um, can you set up default PMT accounts for recurring accounts payable? No. So if you go to, there is no recurring transaction here for, for accounts payable or accounts receivable. I'm sorry, maybe I heard that wrong. It says uh, AP, but they may mean. Uh, no, 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 accounts, accounts payable. So accounts payable, okay. I can't do recurring entries. So for instance, if you do rent every single month, you can, the way you set up a recurring entry, so let's just do this, okay? Here's Carrie, and hey, Carrie, and one, two, three, and I'm going to put this in, the invoice amount is 156, I'm going to put utilities because this is a recurring thing, but you know, typically it's your rent that stays the same or whatever it might be. So anything that you set up here. And then once I come in here, I'm going to double click, I'll find my GL for utilities, and here we go. Now, before I save the transaction, I go in and I say create, and it's going to change my spelling, which is always very good because I can't spell or type spell check complete, and then it says, okay, here's your recurring entry. What do you want to call it? How frequently do you want to do it? Who do you want to remind what user? And then when's the next due date? So if I click okay, it comes in here, and now I save my entry. I've saved that a payable, okay? Now my payable's good. Now I come entry in here, and in December I would say use, and here's my entry. I select it, and it comes in. Now this sort of thing works, the recurring entries work in payables, they work in any of your um, checks, so you see recurring entries. I typically set it up for my clients for payroll, but that's, you know, it works the exact same way. You want to create the recurring entry as you're entering the transaction before you save it, and then once it's in there, you can access it and pull it up anytime. I hope that answered the question. Wonderful. I think that was great. Um, our next question is, is there a way to export email lists? Sure. I mean, you know, we got to talk about where you're going to get those email addresses. So the first way that I would do it is my list of clients. Again, I would go in here, and I might even have this set up because I've done this before. Hang on, let me just see. Uh, no. Okay. So perfect. I'll just do it. Um, let's go to default, let's go to change, and what I would do is we would take away, and again, maybe all you want is the email address, I don't know, but I'll just do it real quickly. So you can get rid of every single, every single item except the email. It won't take me very long. Actually, I should just remove them all. And then we'll go down here, and we'll go to client. And again, it could be a billing email. I don't know what's the one you want, um, but I think it's under client, and it's under, did I miss it? I know it's here because I've done this. Maybe it's under email. That would be too smart. No, that's an email template. Oh my God, Debbie. Um, I hate to waste the time like this, but 
there, it, I promise you it's a field in here because honestly, here we go. Client hey, email Debbie. one. Yep. Yep. Perfect. That's what I was going to tell you. Okay, perfect. There you go. All right. So now what I do is I just save this as email. Okay. I click OK. And then I don't want to make it my default template. But again, now I'm going to say that I want to set, select the editor and I'll actually show it to you on the screen too. And up comes my report. And I don't know if I have any emails here, but again, list of clients. And remember what I said, how it's going to default to that name. I can say email. I would most likely want to save this in Excel because if I'm going to import it and do a mailing, that's the way I do it. So it's going to pop up that spreadsheet for me. But you'll see that this is just a list of all my emails. And on the spreadsheet, I'm not going to get all those empty lines. I'm just going to get the email addresses. Now, that's for clients. You could do the same thing for contacts. So if you go to file, you go to your contact manager, and you can either use, I personally like the export feature, and again, I'm going to choose a layout name, and here's phone and email, but I'll just show you how you can set this up. You're going to go to the common tab, and you just pick the fields you want. You see where it says business email, you could just click home email, I don't really care about the phone numbers, and again, I may not want the names. You, you know, you're going to pick and choose what you want this to be. I'm going to save my changes, and then I'm just going to click export. I'm going to tell it where to save it, what I want the export to be called, what format I want that export in, and if you want it in an Excel spreadsheet or a file that you can then import into Outlook to do a bulk mail, you leave it in CSV and export it, and there's a list of all the email addresses for all of your contacts, and of course your clients wouldn't be, would be included in that as well. So if you want to do a bulk email, this is the best way to do it, through the contact manager. Okay? Wonderful. All right, our next question is, are you able to enter a vendor invoice prior to cutting checks to the company? For example, enter in the invoice on a Monday and cut the check on Wednesday. Absolutely, that's the whole point of accounts payable. So the point of accounts payable is that you have the right, you have the ability, right, I've got too much on my mind. You have the ability to enter a uh, payable invoice, and if it is going to be charged to a client, have it posted to that client, and then you pick whenever you want to pay it. So there are some firms where they collect their expenses prior to paying the vendors. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a mechanism to link the payment of that expense by the client to accounts payable, but again, you just keep track of it. Um, but yes, you should certainly enter a, ven a payable, and then you would, could print a report through accounts payable that's called a payable listing. This is going to show me every outstanding payable. Someone can mark this up and determine what you want to pay, and then you would go on Friday and process all your payables and pick and choose which ones you want to pay. So that, that is the functionality of payables. Wonderful. Um, our next question is, if you enter an invoice number on a check explanation box, will it show up on the printed check? Yes. So, well, that, that's, that's, a, that's not a fair question for me to say so quickly. There are different ways for you to format the way your check is going to be printed, and that's set in your system settings. So you'll notice that I have something called quick check printing, but I also have check templates. If you use the quick check layout in the body, the explanation is the explanation that you put on the check entry. If you are using a template, then you want to be sure that your template has that explanation on the check itself. And so that's what's going to determine how, where or when that explanation or that invoice number is going to show up. So um, one of the checks templates I use is the QuickBooks check. It's check stub stub. But here's that stub explanation. That refers to what you put over here on my general check right here. So if you change these down here on the bottom on the distribution, that doesn't show on the check. It's this box right here on the top portion of the check that shows as the explanation on the check. All right, wonderful. 
Our next question is, I need to know how to edit a template. For example, file info or file open. Okay, so the template editor is probably about a two or three hour lesson or, or training session, but you go into tools. I did that very quickly. Let me stop. You go to tools. You go to template editor. You click file, you click open. Now I assume what you're looking at are labels um, because I believe that that's what those file, um, th that is, it's a case lab label. And here you go, here's file open. So I've showed you how to find those templates. They're called case labels. When you go in and you open that template, you can change whatever you want. The nice thing about labels is they're easy. It's only one section. You can see what fields you can put in those sections right over here. To edit a template, if you want to get rid of a field, you just right click on it and say remove element. If you want to change the size, the font, what it looks like, you can come into the font and change the font. You can change the justification, You right, left, or center justification. If it's a description field, you want to make sure that it's going to wrap. Um, I don't think I have a date field here. I do have a date field. You know, dates are, are one of those fields where you can customize what it's going to look like. What do you want your date to look like? You know, do you want it numbers? Do you want it words? Do you want dashes? Do you want slashes? Do you want 06 or 6? You get to pick and choose. So again, the formatting of all the fields is really right here for you. Another field that allows me to format it is amounts, where you can say whether you want the dollar sign, whether you want the comma, how many decimal plates do you want. Um, so it, it is quite flexible once you get in here, but it's just a matter of editing the template. And so I think if I've shown you where to find those templates, you should be able to come in and change it any way you want. Now one of the other things about template editing is there is a page setup. So if your margins are off, come in here and change the page setup. That was under file, page, setup. And one other thing to note about templates, I'm going to open up another one just so I can show you a different kind. I don't want a label because this is one of the things that people don't know. But when you look at an invoice template, uh, let's go back to my detail template because I always like to pick on it. Where are you, detail? Detail. All right, it doesn't matter. This is fine. Now why am I just seeing that? I don't want this. Okay, let me type in detail. And the reason why I'm, I'm being really, I want a billing template. Thank you. Okay, so if you go into detail, one of the things I want you to know when you edit in, an invoice template is that there are these boxes up here. This box that's highlighted right now, this is going to show you the section view of the layout. If you want to put a page break, if you want different sections, it basically shows you how the bill is laid out. But there are these other two buttons next to it. One of them is show the background of the first page, and the other one is to show the background of the other pages. So PC Law determines a bill layout as the first and then other pages. So if you want titles on top of your other pages, this is where you come to do that. And this is where you come to change it if you want it to be changed. And they are three different editable areas. And again, when you go into the page setup, it does tell you those margins on the first page and then other pages. So if you need a bigger top margin to put other space in there, you just change this to one and then you can come back up here and you'll see that now you have more space to put your information in. You just move it down or whatever you want to do. Um, but that's just something to know about the templates. My suggestion is you always start with a template that PC Law has given you, change it, save it as, and just give it another name so that you always have that, that uh, sample or, or something to use to show you how to do it. I hope that that answered that question. Wonderful. Thanks. That was great. Uh, our next question, this was a question submitted prior, and I just want to take a moment to address it. We do have a question about the Outlook connection with PC Law, um, but that's really more of a product feature and functionality um, question. Can but I do want to show us. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I want to address it. Um, I mean, the Outlook Connection Manager in PC Law has improved over time. I think that it depends upon the version of Outlook you use. I do have quite a few clients that use it. There are problems on a terminal server or on a, could be a problem on a, um, a cloud environment. Um, but 
it does work for the most part, and I have people who use it every day and don't have problems with it. Um, but yes, I can show you how to set it up. If you go to Options, you go to Connection Settings, you say Use this set of books, you put in the user's name of the workstation you're at. If you leave this as admin on every single workstation, when you go to look at your tools user monitor, you'll have no idea whose link it is because everybody will be set up as admin. So I, I really encourage you to put the user's name on the user's workstation. And then under Outlook, you have the ability to connect for um, appointments. That's a bi-directional link between Outlook and PC Law. Here's where you can connect for contacts and again your email tracking. Um, once you set this up and you click OK and you've selected either appointments or contacts, PC Law is going to prompt you for a lawyer's name because it only does the bi-directional sync for appointments for that lawyer. So that lawyer in his Outlook is only going to get his appointments, not everybody else's. Same thing with contacts. Once you turn this on, you can exchange all contacts or just a contact associated with one lawyer. I do caution you with the contact manager because it can get muddy very quickly. So if a client has contacts in Outlook, they have contacts on their cell phone, they have contacts in PC Law, and you just turn it on, you're going to get hundreds of duplicates because they're going going to be duplicates in every single source uh, place. I suggest you create one major contact list. It should probably be in PC Law. Wipe the contacts out of Outlook, wipe the contacts out of your phone, turn on the connection manager, let all of the PC Law contacts go to Outlook, go to your cell phone, and you won't get as many duplicates. It's just a cleaner way. Um, if you're having problems with the connection manager and it's not working, uh, what you will have in the bottom of your screen down here is there will be a connection manager box, and if you open up the Outlook connection manager, most likely you're going to see that there is an error there. Um, if you'd like, I'm more than happy to work with someone offline on this. If you have to reset your Outlook Connection Manager, you do have to remove entries in the registry, um, and it, it, you have to make sure you do it the right way or it's never going to reset. All right, great. Yeah, I think that was wonderful. Um, our next question is, what report do you use to find all time entered for all clients for one day for one attorney? So I, I, I would probably pick a time listing. I would pick one, whoever is your working attorney, I would pick your day here. And if you just want it for one matter, go to the Matters tab and select that matter. And then that will give you a list of all those time entries. You can also do that same sort of thing through the register. Because you could specify a matter you could specify a lawyer, and you could specify a date range. All right, perfect. Our next question is, can you walk through the proper way to set up to enter a client's payment? You go to receive payment. I personally usually start with a matter down here. And once I pick the matter, and I think this guy might owe me money, I pick the matter, I tab one two times, and if he owes me money, it's going to show. Let me see if I can find someone who owes me money. Oh, I know. I did this once before in a demo the other day. Uh, the guy who owes me money, um, I thought it was Able Consulting. He may owe me money. Okay, so I'm going to start this all over because there's a reason why. If I go to receive payment, I pick the client. I want you to look at a couple of things. One, two, here's my outstanding invoices. Automatically puts the client name on top. It automatically puts today's date. I'm going to say this guy paid me, I don't know, he owes me a lot of money, so it doesn't matter, $2,500, okay? And then over here, what I typically do is I create an explanation code that's called payment thank you. I don't think I have one in my demo set, but I use it on my own set, and that would come up and automatically put payment thank you, whatever you want. If you want to put the check number in there, you put the check number here, and PC Law will automatically apply that payment to the oldest invoice first. It's not applying it to a negative 100, they don't owe me money. So the oldest invoice first, it applies it to disbursements and then fees, 
automatically allocates it to the GL account number. Now what I am going to do is I'm going to change this to $50,000 because if the client overpays you, PC Law is going to tell you right away, hey, you have an overpayment. So at this point, you have to resolve it. You're going to click OK, and what PC Law is going to do is default is put it in as a general retainer for the matter. I recommend that that's all that you do because when you do the trust to gen you transfer to trust, you send a refund to the client, there are other entries that get done that affect GL account numbers that may not be the way you want it to do. But this way you have control over how that money is going to be applied. When I click OK, PC Law is going to say, all right, well this is an overpayment. Do you want to pay other invoices? No. I want to enter it as an unallocated receipt. When I set PC Law up for a client, the first thing I do is I create a liability account that's called client retainers. Now that doesn't work in every single state, but in many states you can't you, you want to, this is a liability, you owe that money to the client until you complete that work. Now in some states you can actually put your retainer money commingled with your font, with your operating account, and you can keep it there. And in many of those instances, those clients choose to recognize as income that retainer money as it's received. If you want to do that, that's great. I suggest you create a GL account that is called retainer income and therefore all of your retainer funds will go into that individual account. When you create a bill, it just gets moved from that retainer income account to the allocated attorney account. But I do believe it should be segregated. The default in PC Law, which is something I, I wish they would change, but again, I don't run the organization clearly because I'm still working. Um, the one thing I think that they wish they would change and you should be aware of is down here it says default retainer account. It'll always be your client cost account account 5010 or 1210. It should not be. You should not be commingling your retainers with your client costs. So that is one of the first things I change. But the point being we were at talking about a receipt, I do suggest you enter it as a retainer. If you have to bring it to the trust account, write a check from your general account, receive it in your trust account, bill off the retainer against the truck trust check. If you're sending a refund check to the client, go ahead, write a check to the client, but charge it to that particular matter, and then again you can bill the retainer against the refund. I, I'm an old lady, it's hard to teach me new tricks, but I just like to have more control of my transactions. I hope that answered the question. All right, great. Our next question is, if you pay an invoice from from previously entered invoices, will the invoice number populate on the check automatically, or do you still have to enter the invoice number directly on the check? So I have to assume that this question is referring to accounts payable, and um, again, it's based upon the check format. There is in the template editor a field that you can use on checks that is called, um, and I'll pick this one, and I believe it's not on here, but there is a field that you can use on your checks that is called invoice numbers right here. And that's one of them, but there is also another one. Here's an invoice summary. So if you're paying multiple invoices, this is going to show every single invoice. Um, but again, this has to be on the template for the check or else it doesn't show up. It doesn't happen. Nothing happens automatically with templates. Okay, but so you have a way to put in one invoice or multiple invoices. It's, it's a template thing. So as long as it's on your check template, they'll show up. And that's through accounts payable. All right, great. Our next question is, when we print a disbursement history report, is there a way it can be put in order when I, put my, when I print mine, all the dates are mixed up? So I'm not really sure. Um, you don't have sort field by date. I mean, I, I would kind of hope that it is by date, but I guess it's not. Um, 
it's by matter. So that showed you by default that was by matter, but if I go to my matters tab, um, I really, I really don't have, I, I don't think so. The answer I'm going to say to you is no. I don't think that it's going to work that way. But remember, there's a lot of different ways to print this report to get different information. Um, and based upon what you print, what you choose, you're going to see it a little differently. Um, but I'm afraid there is no way to change it by date. It's by client. It's by matter. That's that's the default, and I don't think you can change it any other way. But perhaps another report that might help you is the client cost journal. Um, I, I happen to like this report. A lot of people don't use it, but I like it. And and this does show you by date all of your disbursements and what GL account they were posted to. So this again, the the, the functionality of this is really more about the report that you choose. One report shows it to you by matter and another one just shows it to you by date. I just got a follow up thing for one matter. Um, would it be possible by date? That's what it looks like there. Is that correct? That's correct. And on this particular report, um, when you do go to print it, you can do this for one matter. You don't have to do it for all matters. So you can select a specific matter and then you would get them by date. And this would show it to you, again, you have to understand that this is going to show it to you whether it's paid or unpaid. Um, when you look at that other report that you that you were looking at the disbursement analysis report, that you can pick whether it's paid, billed, you have a little bit more flexibility there, but again, that's by matter. Um, another way that you could look at it, again, this assumes that it's not billed, is your work in progress. Because work in progress is just going to show it to you by, um, you know, you could just pick your disbursements for one matter. You can do it that way as well, but that's only for unbilled. Um, client cost journal doesn't care whether it's billed or not. Great. They say, perfect, that was exactly what they needed. Perfect. So wonderful. Um, I do have a follow-up to our previous question of um, the report finding time entered for all clients for one day for one attorney. Uh, she was hoping to see all matters for the day to check that all entries were actually made by the attorney into PC Law for that day. Is there another way that you could do that? Can you repeat it just for me one second so I can listen very carefully? Yeah. Um, so she wants to see all the entries for one attorney for the whole day for all clients. And that's to check that all entries were actually made into PC law for the day. So I, I think that I go, I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to go back to the register. And I think that if you pick a day, and again, I don't, I don't have enough data to show you just one day, but if you pick a day, you're going to see all those time entries, and again, you could pick that one particular timekeeper, and you would see all their time entries for that day. Obviously, another way to look at this, which might be helpful, is the time calendar. And because you only look at this time calendar for one timekeeper at a time, and then you could double click on the day and you would see all of those time entries for that day. So, and everything I'm showing you, the register, the calendar, is the same thing as going into time listing. And again, putting in that one person, selecting your day, and just going and seeing all those entries for that day. But this does not sort it by matter. It just sorts it by the day. And maybe that's what she's looking for is a sort by matter. But it, it won't do it that way. But you could on the register, and that's why I do like the register so much, is that once I put it, you know, whomever it is and I put it up, I can sort it by any of these fields. So if I wanted to see it sorted by matter, I could do that. You know, you can sort it by lawyer. You could, you could sort it by any one of the fields by just clicking on it. Perfect. That was exactly what she was looking for. Perfect. So, wonderful. Well, we're out of questions. 
Uh, we have time for one more. If anybody wants to submit one really quickly, we only have three minutes left, so this may just be perfect timing for us. I'm going to give it one more second um, to see if anybody has one final question. I'm doing my little sales ad here, if you guys didn't notice. <laughs> well, go ahead. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Debbie. I didn't really let you uh, explain what you do. No worries. So I'm an independent consultant. I've been servicing PC Law for the past 33 years. I happen to be a CPA. My focus is accounting for lawyers. Um, PC Law is one of the products that I support, but I do support many others. But as I say, my focus is accounting for lawyers. I'm a business consultant. Um, I help attorneys figure out how to make their practice more profitable, how to take the information that they have at their fingertips, and to use it to improve their practice, improve their profitability, and to identify um, what reports they need to print, things of that sort. So PC Law just happens to be a package that I've been with for a very long time, and I do really like the solution, um, but that's what I do. And I service the whole country, um, because as you and I are on this webinar, I can be talking to you on your computer. I have the same utility. So it doesn't matter where in the country you're located, I can service you. Wonderful. Well, thank you for telling us a little bit about yourself, and hopefully some of the people that have lots of questions will reach out to you. Perfect. Um, we didn't receive, oh, go ahead. I think several of you are already my clients, so hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Uh, so with that, we didn't have any additional questions. Um, I actually just saw a hand get raised, so let me, well, I'm getting um, some really great feedback, just um, thank yous. And I do have one last question. We're about a minute out. Maybe this is um, somebody that I'll connect you with on the back end, Debbie. Okay, so, perfect. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and conclude today's webinar. And I want to thank you again, Debbie, for your expert advice uh, and answering all these questions. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for taking the time to 